Hello and welcome back to the free online woodworking school. In this video, we're gonna begin cutting the joinery for the drawer that we marked out in the last episode. So here it is, this is what we're working with. We got two sets of lap dovetails to do, two sets of through dovetails, and they're gonna be nested into a thinner component at the back. And if you remember in the last episode, we set these tails so that they're gonna sit slightly proud of the drawer front, which means when we flush these down, we're flushing down long grain and not end grain, and thus keeping this drawer front nice and snug in the front of the table. And so if you've just joined this video, now go and check out the last one and you'll see exactly how we did that. Let's start cutting out the joinery. So I'm actually going to gang cut a lot of this joinery because these drawer sides are relatively thin and if you stack them together in the vise not only is it quicker but it's actually easier to make sure that you're cutting square because you've got a longer line to kind of reference from. Right so as always we're going to cut on the waist side of the line. I'm going to try and get it straight off the saw and so we'll get the saw lined up with the line on top, match the angle of the dovetail and then just lift it up ever so slightly so that we take out the back edge and that's gonna lock the saw in position. Then we just lower the saw down, track the line from back to front, get it locked in the top. And now all we've got to do is focus on getting the pitch right. So long strokes with the saw. And again, don't worry if you start veering away from the line because we'll trace around it to fit later. cut the sides off. I won't gang cut these and so when I cut these tails off I like to leave a little bit of material to chisel back to. So then we can put the chisel into the shoulder line and because we're looking at it straight on we can check that it's 90 degrees and just tap it down till we hear the sound change, a little twist and that's that shoulder done. Middle section now, again, just cutting it as close to the line as you can so we can easily chisel back to it. Okay, so now we can start chiseling back to these lines. So we'll keep halving the material till we can't anymore. And just tap down to halfway. So again, we'll see if we can half what's left. And now I'm pretty close to the line, so I'll put the chisel into the line. And again, just tap down to halfway. and flip it over. If the saw cuts haven't quite gone to the baseline, just sort of finish them off with a chisel like that. And again, half the material. And that should be that dovetail done. And so now it is exactly the same process on these back tails. So I'll just blast through these and then I'll show you how to transfer and fit them to the pins. Okay, so that's all the tails cut and next we can start transferring those to the pins. But before doing so, I'm actually gonna do the grooves to accept the bottom now because we can use that groove to our advantage when we're lining the tails up above the pin board when transferring the outlines of these to the other component. The groove can be really helpful. So in order to cut these grooves, normally I would use a router table, but I try and be a bit more relatable when doing these videos. And so today I'm gonna be using this, which is a plow plane. There's quite a few adjustments on it, but overall it's pretty simple. This is actually a quarter inch blade in this case. This is a depth stop so that's what prevents the blade from cutting any further than it's about six millimeters in this case. This round here is a fence so we can loosen these and we can change the offset from the blade to make sure we're cutting a equal distance from a wall and um, that's about it. So what I'll do first is just flip these components over and just do a bit of a scribble where that groove's going. That'll prevent me from accidentally doing the outsides or the top edge of the drawer because that wouldn't be so good. And then in terms of the setup, I'm gonna try this first. So I'll just get it up on a platform, clamp it down, and then that should give me access for the fence, clearance for the depth stop, and yeah, I'm gonna have to watch my knuckles, but I think that'll work. But before doing anything, we need to make sure that the blade we've chosen will actually work. So that's the blade there. I wanna make sure that the right-hand side of the blade is basically in line with this square edge here, because we actually wanna sort of cut that square edge away and have the groove right up against it. So we'll just adjust that until we get it in the position we need, which is about there, lock it down. And then with that same setting, we need to move it up 
and check that it's entirely contained within that tail, which in this case it is. If the blade was poking out beyond it into this waist area here, that's where it's gonna show up on the finished joint, which we obviously don't want. And really by this point, the only way you can avoid that is by reducing the width of the blade. Or you could just deal with it and fill the gap later. It's up to you. So I've also set the depth stop up to about five millimeters. And the key with these is to make sure you're always cutting plumb. It's very easy to accidentally tilt these. I tend to look at the fence more than the blade most of the time because it's much easier to see if that's out of square. So when using these, you might be tempted to start all the way back here and just go for it. The problem with that is you've got a lot of area here for the blade to track the grain and it can be very difficult to get it back on course afterwards. The easiest way to deal with this is to start with a short stroke here and then move it back a bit longer and then move it back further and what you'll find when you do this is you'll take a short stroke and then the blade will fall into the track that it's previously created. Don't get me wrong, it's still easy to shift off course with this method, but it does make it significantly easier. If you ever use rebate planes, this is much the same thing. So really take your time with this while you're establishing this track. So hopefully you can see a track has started being created. Still got to be careful because it's very shallow at this point, but we'll just keep going down to depth. Okay, and now the draw front. I think I'm gonna be working against the grain on this, so we'll see how it performs. Not too bad so far. As long as it doesn't tear out beyond the groove, I'm not really worried about what it looks like at the bottom. Right, so now what we can do is, on the back of these tails where the groove is, you might remember I said make this marking gauge line nice and deep. This isn't a complete necessity, it's just a nice little trick to help with your alignment. If you come in with a chisel now and just do a very shallow sort of cut going down to that marking gauge line, and do that all the way along, you might need to come back in from above to sort of finish it off in places. So what we've created here is called a V groove. It's still got a 90 degree edge on that shoulder line, but then we've just got a ramp going down to match it. So here comes the cool bit of transferring. Tails B and pins B. If we get the pins up in the vise, We'll just get this plane behind it to act as a support for the tails. Make these pins sit a couple of millimetres proud, clamp it in position, slide the plane back, and what you'll find is that little V-groove we put on the back gives you sort of positive location on the back side of this pin board. It's not much, it can still slip over, but it's just about enough to sort of confirm that front to back placement. The only thing you've got to worry about is the side to side, and this is why we cut the grooves. Because if you get a shim that's the exact width of that groove, you slot it into it, you can then slot the tails over that groove, lock it in position, slide it up that shim until you get the lock from the V groove. And now you know that you're locked in position front to back and side to side. It's such a cool technique this, I, I nerd out on it every time. It also just makes it so much easier to hold the tails because they're not scooting around all over the place. You can just have a little bit of pressure from above and carefully transfer around the tails which is what we're gonna do now. This, by the way, is one of the main advantages of the marking knives that I sell. The blade that's designed to fit in here is really nice and thin, so it can easily get between the tails, but it's still pretty rigid. It's not all flimsy like a scalpel blade is. So we'll hold it down nice and firmly, and we'll just start by doing a light pass next to the tail before increasing the pressure slightly on the second. We'll do that on each side. Now all we've got to do is square those lines down to match the shoulder line. We marked that in the last episode. And then mark out the waist. We can also do a very similar thing on the back. So this is the back of the drawer, this is the side. We've obviously got the groove. If we just slot the shim into that, we can then use that as a side stop to help us get the placement of this correct. So that's it in position. Carefully knife around each of the tails. And then we've also got this 90 degree wall up here that we definitely want to knife around. Because this one, once we've cut these two sockets, we can plane this material away to get back to that line. So what we can do now is, with those 90 degree marks we put up either end of the wood, we can just join those together with a knife line. Because I said we can plane this material down. This will give us a line all the way along 
that we can plane back to. To be honest, we'll probably need to cut most of that away. So now all of the pins are marked out on the drawer and we can start cutting them out. Now, obviously earlier in this project, we've already done lap dovetails in the top of the drawer. So I'm not gonna go too in depth with these. It's very much the same process. And as for the through dovetails on the back of the drawer, again, it's very much the same concept. However, if you do want a more step-by-step -step walkthrough, in a previous project where we made a cabinet, we made this exact same drawer construction and it was broken down into much smaller stages. And so if you do think you need a little bit of extra help with this drawer construction, go and take a look at that series because it is exactly the same as this, just different dimensions. So here you go, now you can see that the joint is all ready to go together, with exception to that little bit of material at the top that needs to be planed down. Okay, so with the drawer dry assembled, now we can start thinking about fitting the bottom. You can do this after the drawer is glued up, but we can actually use the bottom to kind of help keep this rigid and square when it's under the pressure of clamps. Now, most of the time, I would just recommend either slotting in a solid piece of plywood or MDF, maybe with veneer on one side, maybe you could felt it afterwards. It's really up to you, but in the spirit of overcompensating in terms of demonstrating techniques, I'm gonna do it with a solid wood base, which is currently slightly thicker than the groove. And so we're gonna to need to cut a rebate around three of the edges, and then we'll do some nice sort of decorative chamfer leading into the rebate afterwards that um, despite rarely being seen, will be a nice detail. So let's start it. Now, traditionally for drawer bottoms, you would use cedar because it's got a nice aromatic smell and it can actually be insect repellent as well. I don't have any cedar in stock, but I do have this, which is camphor, and it has got the most amazing smell. And so if you ever see it, I definitely recommend picking some up because from memory, it was pretty cheap. And so I thought we'd give it a go. In terms of orientation, you're going to want to make sure the grain is going across the drawer, especially if you're using solid wood, because this grain is going to want to expand and contract across the grain. And so if we've got it locked in the drawer this way, it will be locked between the two grooves and it's going to want to push the drawer sides apart. Whereas instead, turning it 90 degrees will make it so it's fixed in the front of the drawer, but is then able to expand and contract underneath the back of the drawer, which is another advantage of having this design with the open back on it rather than having the bottom sealed from all edges because it would be a bit more difficult to account for all that movement. So the first thing is we've got to size it so that it can fit between these two grooves. So as always, we'll just get a face edge established on this drawer something straight and 90 degrees that we can then reference from when sizing these edges so what I'm going to do now is just offer it up to the back of the drawer pick which side you want on the top but then flip it over so we're doing this on the underside and just get it sort of central on those grooves and then just put a mark where those grooves kind of open up now what you can do is set a gauge either to those marks or slightly over. I'm actually going to do it a couple of millimetres over because it'll just give us a bit of space for the later processes. So I'm going to cut this marking gauge line pretty deep, basically as deep as the cutter will let me before it sort of bottoms out on the stock of the marking gauge. Same again here, just confirm that it is over the line. And then we're also going to need to do it on the front because we need to fit it into the groove there as well. Now we're going to be using a rebate plane to cut a rebate on the edge of these to thin it down in order to fit it into the groove. The only thing we're lacking at the moment is how far down do we need to go in order to create that thickness. So what you can do here is just confirm the width of your groove, which is six millimeters for me. We'll just measure it in a few locations to be sure. Six 
and six. Set your marking gauge to six millimeters or whatever the width of your groove was. And then you can actually scribe that from the, I guess this would be the top of the drawer because we're removing material from the bottom in order to leave a six millimeter section on the top. Just scratch a line all the way along as so then we can see how far in we need to remove in order to fit it into the groove and how far down we need to remove in order to leave us with a six millimeter tongue. And now with your rebate plane, all you need to do is set it so the depth stop is quite shallow. And then we can just gradually increase the depth of the depth stop in order to sneak up to that line. Set the fence to get the desired offset we're looking for. Looks to be around about there. And then exactly as we did with the plow plane when cutting the grooves, you're gonna to want to start on the end, do a short stroke, move it back, slightly longer stroke, move it back just so it can fall into the previous rebate. And that way you haven't got to commit to getting the entire thing straight on the first pass. It does feel a bit stupid, but when I'm using these, I really try and lock the plane into my body and then just let my legs carry it through. If you're just doing this all with your arms, it's quite easy to accidentally introduce tilt. Whereas if you just let your legs carry it through, you tend to be able to get it a bit more consistent. So we're bottoming out there. We are not at the correct depth yet. So we'll just increase the depth on this depth stop and continue. Very nearly there. There we go. Looks like we're down to the line there. So now we'll just flip this 90 degrees and do the same on the sides. And having that deep marking gauge line there should prevent us getting any sort of splitting beyond the line. Normally these rebate planes have a little nicker on the front that does that just before it cuts it, but this one is missing it. In theory, this should fit. <laughs> so you can see we've got a small gap up either side of the drawer, but that's on the underside because we're going to do some like chamfer around the edge to sort of lead into the groove. On the inside, however, it is perfectly closed up because the tongue is only on one side of this bottom. The other thing we need to account for slightly is the fact that when these joints bottom up, it will slightly close up that gap on the bottom. But in this case, it's an intentional design feature. We'd actually call that a shadow gap, I guess, if we wanted to justify it. So now it's up to you how you do these chamfers really. This chamfer is very soft so I'm not sure it's going to hold up too well to be planed across the grain like that. Not too bad but I'll probably just do it with sandpaper. Just wrap it around a hard block. Little chamfer all the way around. Just makes it look a little bit better finished than it already was. We can just draw a line along the back here. All of this is waste. And so then when that slots in there, once it's all glued up, we can just plane this edge down to be completely flush because it is just sticking proud a little bit at the moment. And so that's all of the draw done. Next, we can start thinking about gluing it up. But before doing so, probably want to pre-finish the inside faces, make sure they're all sanded, make sure they've got a layer of finish on them to help resist any glue squeeze out. And above all else, give us a little glimpse of what this curly maple is going to look like. I am very excited by this. I'm sure this doesn't need explaining again. So for the sides and front, I'm just going to do a simple Osmo hard wax oil, which is what I've used for the rest of the project. And for the base, I'm just going to use some lemon oil. This stuff is super low build. It won't do much to protect the wood, but it will provide some sort of finish over the top. The main reason I'm going for it is one, because it smells nice. And I think that in combination with the camphor should be really cool. And two, well, it's kind of in one, but because it's such low build, it should allow the smell of the camphor to still come through rather than completely burying it under a layer of finish. So the dry fit has gone to plan. I will always reiterate this. It's always worth going through a dry fit first. Firstly, to make sure that it actually goes together and you can get it square. And secondly, 
It also just makes sure you've got everything ready to go. You know that you've got all the clamps you need, you know you've got all the blocks. It's just a good thing to do before doing the main show. Speaking of which, let's do it. I still haven't got around to ordering low tack tape to tape off the inside of this drawer. Normally I would do it, but I'm just gonna be a little bit conservative with the glue because the other thing I want to make sure is that I don't glue the bottom in place as well. If you were concerned about it, you could always wax the inside faces as well as that drawer bottom, which is something I would do in a lot of cases. I'm just wanting to preserve the smell of this camphor because it's very nice. Right, so the drawer is all glued up. Seems to have closed up really nicely. I've checked it for square by measuring the diagonals and we can see that it fits in here nice and snug. And the reason that's worked so well is because when we set those tails out, we marked it so they stuck ever so slightly out from the front. And so that even after compression from the clamps, it still ended up quite snug and we can plane it down to fit later on. So the only thing we've got to do now is get this bottom fixed in position and there's a really simple way of doing that. All we're gonna do is put a simple screw through the bottom of the drawer into the back and when we do so, we just need to allow for a little bit of expansion and contraction at the back here. If you wanted a more permanent fit, you could glue it in position but only do so in the first couple of inches because again, it needs to be fixed there but still able to expand at the back. But for whatever reason, the bottom might get damaged or you might want to replace it at some point in the future. And so just having a screw in the back there that you can undo, slide it out, slide a new one in is, um, I guess, preferable. It's more traditional. But to make it easier to get into place, the first thing we're going to do is just plane down this excess material so that we can set up a marking gauge to the middle of the back. Try and go steady when you do this and also make sure that you've got both sides of the drawer supported with clamps. The sides on this drawer are relatively thin and so with pressure from the plane, it could end up skewing and loosening the drawer, which is another reason to make sure that your plane is nice and sharp. So we're just gonna plane through and the other thing to watch out for is end grain on the opposite side. As we sort of approach getting this flush, I'll probably start planing from each side into the middle to make sure that I don't cause any breakout on the far edge. No, I won't, because that's going against the grain. We're just gonna have to go for a really light cut and just be careful not to punch off that grain. So now, if we get a marking gauge and set it to half the thickness of the back, lighten that down, flip it over, and then just do a little mark on the back. And we'll just measure that across the width as well. 184, what's half of that? 92. And I've already sized the screw that I'm gonna use for this, so we'll pile it through according to that. Now I'll just pull this bottom out slightly to turn it into a clearance hole. Should go straight through. There we go. Finally, a countersink. If you're doing a plywood or an MDF base or any other man-made material, this would be absolutely fine. But for us, because it's solid wood, we need to expand that slot and countersink now. And so all we need to do is just cut an access hole or an access slot, I should say, to that hole. There's probably some router cutters that will do this, but if we're doing this all by hand, this would be the method in which to do it. And then with a sharp chisel, we'll just sort of blend that countersink into the back edge here as well. Do a bit of clean up in the slot as well. So now we can slide that in and get that screw in position. And as simple as that, that is the bottom of the drawer fixed in position. Just bear in mind that what I've just demonstrated only allows for shrinkage. The reason for that is because this workshop is relatively humid compared to sort of the conditions of a home. And so the only thing I would expect this to do is shrink. If you wanted to allow room for expansion, easiest way to do it would either be to drill that hole slightly back so that it gives room to expand into the screw, or you can simply take a little bit off the tongue at the front and then this would be your fixed position and the drawer can kind of expand front to back into it. The advantage of making the tongue on the drawer on the top is that this will never open a gap on the inside as long as the bottom actually stays within that groove. This gap on the underside, however, will change, but 
it's on the bottom of the drawer so it's not going to be seen that regularly and so that is how you construct a traditional drawer and in the next video we're going to begin fitting it in here to get ourselves hopefully a nice piston fit like i said in this video this is a uh, this gives you the majority of the processes but if you want a more in-depth comprehensive view on all the ins and outs of this including making gluing blocks getting it assembled making sure it's square check out the cabinet project because it is the exact same construction just different dimensions but it goes into much finer detail so as always thank you very much for watching if you enjoyed the video please don't forget to press the like button subscribe if you haven't already and i'll see you in the next one